From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today has been provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. Connecting West Virginia families and businesses through high-speed Internet services. Learn more about connecting at Frontier.com. At the legislature today, the Senate considers legislation that updates laws having to do with livestock. This section of the state's code hasn't been revisited since the 1920s. And we'll return to a lesson in legislative basics tonight. With three weeks remaining in the session, lawmakers face certain deadlines that dictate their work. This is the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. Governor Tomlin and legislative leaders this afternoon held a news conference to herald the passing of the education reform bill. After intense negotiations last weekend, the bill passed the Senate on Monday with predictions that it would pass the House and go to the governor by Friday. Those predictions turned out to be right on point. Dave Mistich reports from the House of Delegates. House Republicans used a string of analogies in describing Senate Bill 359 before it went to vote. After a lengthy explanation of the bill from Education Chair Mary Poling, Delegate John McCuskey of Kanawha County kicked off the floor debate. Although he urged passage and thanked those involved in shaping the bill, he said there is still work to be done. What I also know about this bill is that we are, that we are voting on something that isn't nearly as strong as what was introduced to us about a month ago. There's still major holes in our education system, and each of these deficiencies hurts our kids. This is a result of the nature of compromise, which in the political system and the educational arena means kids lose. This is unacceptable. We need to see this measure for what it is. It's the first ingredient in a complicated recipe that when put together correctly with the right leadership can lead to sustainable change. House Minority Whip Daryl Coles proposed an amendment yesterday that would authorize a charter school system in the state. Although his and four other GOP proposed amendments were voted down, Coles stood in support of the bill and used a baseball analogy to describe his thoughts on how the bill fell short. I rise in support of this bill. Students in West Virginia deserve better and we can do better. This bill accomplishes some good things. Finally, 180 days of instruction, some hiring reforms that get the best choice teacher in front of the classroom, and more. But it's a serious effort, a solid accomplishment. Maybe not a grand slam or a home run, but what I would call a, a stand-up double. Delegate Larry Kump of Berkeley County made a reference to Shakespeare in announcing his lack of support for Senate Bill 359. I really don't know yet how I'm going to vote on this bill. I'm still listening and I'm still pondering. Senate Bill 359 in my mind so far has some good, some bad, and some that just quite frankly befuses and befuddles me. Some of the discussion I've heard on this bill so far reminds me of a scene from Macbeth full of sound and fury and I'm not sure just yet what it signifies. House Majority Leader Brent Boggs noted that the bill's success is due to involvement from stakeholders and all the other players in the legislative process. He, like McCuskey, said this could just be the beginning. We had a situation where the governor, the Senate, the service personnel, the teachers, our board, state board of education, the business community, all came together and worked over a period of months to craft something that is a good, solid piece of legislation way beyond what we have now and a wonderful place that we can build upon as a building block in the future. I think when you say that something is a building block, that doesn't mean you're settling for something that's second rate. I think that you recognize the fact that it's a positive, but even a positive can be built on in the future. Delegate Josh Stowers of Lincoln County who works as an assistant principal at Horace Mann Middle School, said he feels personally responsible for the bill and the students and teachers it affects. 
I can give you a whole bunch of reasons why you should vote for this bill. There's about 505 down in Canal City that I go to and see every day that I miss when I'm here. And in good faith, I could never, never do anything that I thought would be bad for them. I walk in school every day and make decisions about their safety, about their future. And I do that with the utmost seriousness because some of them don't have somebody to look out for. The governor's education reform bill passed 95 to 2. The only two no votes came from Delegate Kump and Delegate Marty Gearhart, both Republicans. The House went on to pass 11 other bills. Among those was House Bill 2354, which would require pawnbrokers to record and maintain records of pawn transactions and sales. It would also require those pawning or selling items at a pawn shop to provide a photo ID. For the legislature today, I'm Dave Mistich in the House of Delegates. Also today, the House passed a resolution honoring the two state police troopers killed in the line of duty last August. An interchange on Interstate 79 near where the two were shot by a man in custody will be named after State Police Corporal Marshall Lee Bailey and Trooper Eric Michael Workman in their honor. The resolution will next be considered by the Senate. If the Constitution of the state of West Virginia is to be changed, it's up to the voters to change it. Two constitutional amendments were introduced into the Senate today relating to how the legislature operates. Ashton Mara has that story and other Senate news today. Senator Eric Wells of Kanawha County sponsored two constitutional amendments on the floor today. The first... Senate Joint Resolution 9 by Senator Wells proposing constitutional amendment designated organization of houses of the legislature amendment. Would require new members of both chambers to take their oaths of office on December 1st after an election as a way to create consistency. The second. Senate Joint Resolution 10 by Senator Wells proposing constitutional amendment designated veto session amendment. Wells says the amendment would give the legislature more oversight. The governor either signs or vetoes any bill passed by both houses during the session. This amendment would create a veto session in which legislators return to the Capitol to vote to override any of the governor's vetoed bills. Currently, the state constitution requires either four-fifths of the members of the legislature or the governor to call the legislature into session. Three bills were on third reading. Senate Bill 201 is a health bill that allows doctors to treat patients that they have not examined but know are likely ill. Judiciary Chair Senator Corey Palumbo explains. Committee substitute for committee substitute for Senate Bill 201 would allow health care providers to provide to prescribe antibiotics for a sexual partner of a patient they're treating for a sexually transmitted disease without first having to conduct an examination of that partner. The bill defines some terms and uh, and requires DHHR to develop an outreach materials for use in counseling patients with sexually transmitted diseases. I urge pass to the bill. The bill passed on a 33 to 0 vote with one senator absent. Senate Agriculture and Rural Development Committee Chair Senator Ronald Miller explains Senate Bill 341, a bill updating language he says hasn't been considered since the 1920s. The committee substitute, the committee substitute for Senate Bill 341 states that livestock must be enclosed by a fence that is built to reasonably prevent livestock from escaping the closure. It requires adjoining, uh, adjoining landowners to pay for a just proportion of the cost of partition fence between land used for grazing and livestock purposes. It permits the Commission of Agriculture to establish rules for the numerous types of fences. That bill also passed 33 to 0. The final bill up for a floor vote dealt with child support enforcement. Uh, Senate Bill 407 uh, deals with the current law which we have which allows the Bureau for Child Support Enforcement to subpoena records for, from public utilities and cable television companies for certain reasons. This bill would also include telephone companies and cell, cell phone companies to that list. I urge passage of the bill. Has every member voted? Has every member voted? The bill passed 33 to 0. I hereby declare that bill passed. Clerk will communicate the action of the Senate to the House. For the legislature today, I'm Ashton Mara in the Senate. 
In a moment, we revisit legislative basics. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 597, permitting county boards of education to sell advertising on school bus exteriors. Senate Bill 601, removing the requirement that certain juvenile proceedings be sealed. Senate Bill 604, expanding the definition of electioneering communication to include certain non-broadcast media. Senate Bill 610, Governor Tomlin's bill to rename the Industrial Home for Youth in Salem so that it can be closed and reopened as an adult correction facility. And Senate Bill 617, to increase the criminal penalties for the offenses of driving under the influence of alcohol, controlled substances, or drugs. The bill is named after a Point Pleasant girl who was killed as a result of a head-on collision with a drunk driver. Senate Bill 622, providing boards of governors at WBU and Marshall with additional authority and flexibility. And Senate Bill 624, adjusting penalties for willful failure to pay child support. Up for passage in the Senate on Monday, Senate Bill 190, the governor's bill relating to public-private transportation projects. Senate Bill 404, to clarify that a child who is physically healthy and presumed safe is a neglected child if he or she is habitually absent from school without good cause. This bill provides an exemption for parents whose children are receiving home instruction. And Senate Bill 461, procedures and protections for child witnesses and domestic relations, child abuse, and neglect in criminal proceedings. The bill sets forth the rights of child witnesses. We welcome back our guest tonight. Political scientist Tom Stevens has been president of government relations specialist for the past 28 years. Prior to that, he worked for eight years in the administration of former Governor Jay Rockefeller, where he also served as the commissioner for the Department of Motor Vehicles. In addition, Tom has held staff leadership positions for both the state senate and the House of Delegates. Tom, welcome back. Great Glad to be here. here. Yes. I wanted you to come here because there are very important deadlines coming up next week. There on are. On Monday. The yep. big deadline on Monday is? The last day for individual members of the House and the Senate to introduce bills. After that, no more bill introduction by members. Mm -hmm. Now, that cutoff date does not prohibit uh, legislative committees from originating bills in committees, and it also doesn't stop the introduction of supplemental appropriation bills. They so to deal with money. That's right. dealing with money. Yes. And supplemental appropriations. So that's Monday. What is Sunday, March 31st? Well, that, that is, by rule, mm -hmm. the the last day that bills can leave the final committee that they've been referred to in order to get out onto the floor of either the House or the Senate um, to be out there for three individual days for readings before we get to crossover day. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about that, I know, later. Yeah, later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on Sunday then, March 31st, they won't be in session, but that's the last day that a bill can be in a committee. It's got to be out of committee and on the floor by, say, Monday morning. Right. Okay. That's correct. All right. Uh -huh. Why is it necessary to impose these rules? Well, the Constitution uh, requires the bills be read on three different days. It says three several days, but mm -hmm. um, and we talked about that when we were uh, when we were reviewing the legislative process because the final day is the passage. The day before that is the amendment and the day before that first reading where it's read. Mm -hmm. So in order, in order not to suspend the rules, which you can do mm -hmm. to compress those days, um, they have to go through those three separate days and, and there are other deadlines that are in place and so you have to back up from that in order to get to the Sunday <laughs> exiting of committees and as you said, um, we don't expect them to meet on Sunday, maybe not on Saturday, so that yeah, yeah. that means Friday is the day. The day that has to be out of the committee. Yeah, final committee, right. All yeah. right, okay. What's the difference between a bill and a resolution? Now today, the House passed a concurrent resolution mm -hmm. that honors the two uh, state police officers who were killed in a line of duty last summer. They want to name an interchange after them. Right. What's the difference between a bill and a resolution? Well, actually, there are different forms of 
resolutions, just like there are different forms of bill. But generally speaking, a bill proposes a law or a change to a current law. There are really three different types of resolutions. You actually talked about another one on your show with, with Eric Wells and a constitutional mm -hmm. amendment. Mm -hmm. So the first type of resolution is very common, done every day, both the House and the Senate. And well, although the House uses the term citation rather than resolution, and that's to honor or to celebrate an event. Uh, a concurrent resolution, which is the, tr uh, the, the troopers' resolution, it is just that. It's concurrent, meaning it has to pass both the House and the Senate in the same form, and it's co commonly done. Mm -hmm. And then there's the joint resolution. That's the resolution that proposes um, a constitutional amendment, which then, if enacted by the legislature, would go on to the ballot. Mm -hmm. for the voters to decide. Mm -hmm. But the important thing really to remember the difference is a very good question is a bill proposes law and a resolution does not. Okay. It's an action. All right. All right. Now a bill passed today, the education reform bill passed today. Hooray. <laughs> and um, now how long will it be before the governor actually signs the bill? Well, that's a good question. Um, there's a, uh, a process, internal process that the legislature uses whenever a, when a bill advances in any form. For example, when a bill passes one house and goes over to the other, they engross the bill. That means they include everything that's been done to it. And then when a bill passes both houses in the same form to go to the governor, um, and we talked about a lot about that the last time, then it's enrolled. And there's actually an enrolled committee mm -hmm. that has to review to make sure that everything is exactly the way that it should be. And then it goes to the governor. So the governor can't sign it till it goes through that process, which can be rather speedy mm -hmm. um, to get it to him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then he has several different options as to how a bill would become law when it, when it comes to him. And he has certain deadlines. He during does. the legislative session and then after the legislative session to sign a bill. That's correct. And, and um, actually, a law doesn't necessarily have to, because of those deadlines, have to be signed by the governor, and many bills aren't. Mm -hmm. And they simply become law if there is no action taken by the governor at all. Of course, the reverse action would be if the governor would veto it, mm -hmm. not likely, with the education bill. But it's also a process of the, okay, the legislature passes the bill, it's enrolled, it's in its final form, right. but there's still, the clerks have to see it, it's got to be proofread, it's got to be reviewed by the governor's attorneys, Correct. and there is a, there's a lot happening, and, and governors have. Uh, on some of these bills that are very, very important. The minute they're passed, the governor goes down and he signs the bill. Mm -hmm. But actually, there's a lot that has to happen between the time it passes the legislature and the time that the governor actually puts his name to it. Well, from the legislative perspective, that's the enrollment process. Yeah. From okay. the governor's perspective, after he gets the enrolled bill, then you're exactly right. He'll want you know his staff to mm -hmm. go through it and make sure that uh, it meets muster, mm -hmm. and uh, and he has vetoed bills that are, are incorrect. That's correct. Yeah, for technical or mm -hmm. it's not that he didn't yeah. like the bill. It's just that exactly. there's a, there's a failure in it. Right now, the legislature can go back um, in a, with a bill like that if it's vetoed while they're still in session and make corrections mm -hmm. to it, mm -hmm. uh, or even in special sessions. Um, but that's all part of the process. That is. What is a fiscal note? A uh, fiscal note. Um, when legislation is proposed, it, it can have uh, an impact on state revenues or expenditures. And so um, the legislature requires that when there is a fiscal impact, a financial impact, um, on either revenue coming in or expenditures going out, that the agency, the state agency, board, commission, or whatever it is, um, that would be responsible either, either for bringing in the money or for spending the money, calculate um, on a pre-prescribed form and give it to the legislature with an estimate of 
money that would come in or that would go out. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a matter of does it make money or does it cost money? Right. A it's tax not, bill is going to make money. Right. And then there's bills that are going to cost money. Yeah, and like building a new debt. prison, for example, would cost a lot of money. Right. Yeah. Okay. But a cigarette tax would bring in money. Right. So there's, okay, that's that's the fiscal well, note. Actually, there could be both because um, when you're bringing in money, it might cost money to enforce the ability to bring it in. So you would have an associated cost for personnel or whatever, um, and that would also be balanced, like on a ledger, fiscal okay. note would have both what it would cost to implement it and what it would bring in. There's always every session a question as to the validity of fiscal notes. That the theory is that if it requires a state agency to do something, they'll make the fiscal note really high, that it's mm -hmm. going to be too expensive to Unless implement. Unless they want it. <laughs> or, yeah, or they lowball it. Right. D what, what do you think of that? What's, what's your theory about that theory? Um, the, <clears throat> I, you know, it happens. Um, but uh, the, the finance committees uh, under uh, Senator Prezioso and Delegate White um, have uh, been very, I think, stern with agencies because they're, they're responsible for, uh, for passing legislation that impacts what comes in and what goes out. And uh, I think uh, state agencies and boards and commissions today respect um, the, the uh, sternness of those two committee chairmen to get the fiscal notes right. So fiscal notes are accurate, but well, they are relied on a great deal they absolutely by are. members of the legislature yeah. who pour over fiscal notes as much as they pour over bills. They do, they really absolutely. Want to Particularly when you know we're in a budget situation where we are uh, today, where incoming revenue or outgoing expenditures really need to be calculated because our Constitution requires our state budget to be balanced. So we can't spend more than we take in. All right. Tom Stevens, delightful to talk with you again. I hope you'll be back with us as we wind down this session to kind of guide us through the uh, final weeks of the session and uh, how it all ends up. All Always right. a pleasure Tom to be here. Tom Stevens, thank, thank you very much. And here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 3043, including methane monitoring equipment as eligible safety equipment for tax purposes. House Bill 3057, making it illegal to operate a motor vehicle while using a wearable computer with a head-mounted display. House Bill 3066, making cell phone use while driving a primary offense and to prohibit the denial of motor vehicle insurance coverage based on the prohibited use of electronic communications devices while driving. House Bill 3072, to provide a tax credit to coal producers who sell coal to users that increase their consumption of West Virginia coal in this state for the purpose of increasing coal production and coal-related employment. And House Bill 3075, to permit the disposal of drill cuttings and associated drilling mud generated from well sites in solid waste landfills. Up for passage in the House on Monday, House Bill 2463, to repeal the article of the West Virginia Code that permits the sterilization of persons deemed to be mentally incompetent. On second reading, House Bill 2237, to prevent deaths caused by accidental opiate overdose by requiring prescribers to offer a prescription of the medication naloxone to patients for whom opioids are prescribed and require that information and education on naloxone's beneficial and proper use in case of an overdose be made available to patients, family members, and caregivers. House Bill 2583, to establish a statewide system for sexual assault forensic examination services. The bill creates a state commission and local boards that are authorized to establish an examination plan for sexual assault victims. The bill provides timely examinations and assists victims with support services and effective evidence collection. And House Bill 2590, Governor Tomlin's bill to promote the productive reuse of idled and underutilized commercial, industrial, and mining properties. And this has been the Legislature Today. We'll be back on Monday with more news from the first regular session of the 81st West Virginia Legislature. We welcome your comments and questions about the issues at this legislative session and 
our coverage of them. You can email us at feedback at wvpubcast.org. And remember that full episodes of The Legislature Today are available on our website. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today has been provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. Connecting West Virginia families and businesses through high-speed Internet services. Learn more about connecting at Frontier.com.